so I probably should make sort of two disclaimers. One is that, obviously, with me talking about the Department of Work and Pensions, um, and it is filmed live, that uh, these are quite often these stories that I'll tell are anecdotal and they're from patients who have contacted us and spoke to us directly. And uh, the other one is, hi, Mum. Hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, as Ian mentioned, we get a lot of, we've done a lot of survey work and things like that, and um, often one of the topics that crops up is benefits, you know, the, the financial impact of PH is up there on the agenda, up there with quality of life and early diagnosis. So with that in mind, um, I sort of took it upon myself to run through training courses, speak to people, speak to partnership organisations and just generally try and understand better the system in which we're working in, which has brought about a couple of publications, uh, this one which I'm particularly proud of and uh, we're trying to get an award for. Yeah. Um, but this sort of speaks about general practical advice on if you're running through a, an application for a particular benefit or anything like that, um, the advice and pitfalls you may fall through. Um, so Ian often talks about um, Bevan, the father of the NHS, and I thought that was quite an apt uh, quote for something such as benefits, because we are going to have to fight for this. There, there, are, no easy, there are no easy answers. It's not going to come to you that you are going to have to fight. And the amount of people that phone up having appealed, having been turned down, it's, it's ridiculous, it really is. And they'll often um, give you the impression that maybe you don't necessarily deserve this. And if you feel that you do, then you will persist, you must persist, you must fight for it. Oh. Um, so your first hurdle is um, pulmonary hypertension. It's not a topic in which many people understand. Um, your form will go off and it will be sent to the Department of Work and Pensions after you've filled in your 18, 20 pages of whatever it is and explained your life story. Um, that will then be sent and somebody will look at that and say, well, pulmonary hypertension, what's that? And if you get a really good one, then they'll look at it and they'll look into it and they'll think, well, okay, this is it. If not, oh, well, it's high blood pressure. No, that's not. Um, but the greatest thing with, and I'll stick to PIP as a, as a benefit because that, for the majority of individuals, is probably what you'll come across at a certain point, whether it's transitioning from DLA or whether or not it's applying as a new applicant, is it's all based on functionality. It's not, nobody, it's not your condition. It's not what it is you suffer from, whether or not it's um, pH or any other condition. It's all about how you as an individual function in day-to-day -day life and what you can do out and about. So somebody thought that this man could function well enough as an actor, as the President of the United States of America. Um, well, um, but that is what the Department of Work and Pensions are doing when you send your form off, is they're going through your answers and they're working through them, wondering, right, how can this person function as a job? What can they do? Not what can't they, what can they? And as they're running it through, it's all based on points. Um, DLA was based off old um, case law, so if somebody with a similar condition was diagnosed and given um, X, Y and Z, then you would be as well, because that's the way the system worked. PIP, it's all based on how many points can you get. So they'll work it through, so on this one it's uh, planning and following journeys, and you will start on zero, and they will work through your answers and sort of try and now, what they're meant to do is work from the bottom and work their way up. So they'll work with the highest point total and work till they hit one, whether or not that happens. Um, and then what you need is to attain over the course of these particular criteria is eight points to 12 points, dependent upon whether or not you're going for the lower rate or higher rate. And the same with mobility. So... One of the things that cropped up, and we did a, um, it was while I was on my training programme, and we'd gone and we'd spoken to individuals who were being trained by the Department of Work and Pensions, lawyers, solicitors that were there, and they'd just started their, their post. And uh, we were asking sort of, well, what, what is it that people are, what, what is it that you guys want to see from people who are applying? Is there a particular phrase, are there particular things that are important to you as you're running through? Because... Phrases that I use, maybe not what they use, and vice versa. So they gave us a list as long as there are. And it is, there is all available in a publication which is out by the ballroom, which will be manned by the lovely people I've brought with me. 
Um, but sort of the four key phrases that I thought were really important and something that maybe potentially you could all use on particular applications is frequent, significant, prolonged and reliable. So frequent, and th this, has been, this is how the Department of Work and Pensions define it. That is a, those are lawyers that they've paid an abundance amount of money to come up with and create. So it's not being done by some guy sat in a back room. These are legally binding definitions. So frequent, several times, not just once or twice, in a 24-hour period. So that doesn't have to, that is over the course of a full 24 hours, not just when you're awake, full 24 hours. So I've given examples, and again, they're in the publication, but uh, I frequently become breathless when doing day-to-day -day activities. So if that's you, that's a phrase that you can use. Significant, so experiencing symptoms for a period of time that means an hour or thereabouts can be multiple events adding up to an hour. So it doesn't have to be one bout, it can be many again throughout the day, but as long as it adds up to an hour, that's a definition that you can use to describe your symptoms when explaining them to the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, so again, an example I've used, um, I deal with significant fatigue throughout the day. Again, if it's something you can use, great stuff. Uh, prolonged, 20 minutes. So that's not, that is just a single bout, 20 minutes, but that's a prolonged episode. So uh, prolonged, I suffer from prolonged bouts of breathlessness. So as Janelle's just explained, if that's, some, if that's something that you do suffer from, that'd be a definition you could use. And these, again, are all uh, accepted by the Department of Work and Pensions of the administrators that work through them. Uh, and the final one, uh, which is personally, I think, and whenever anybody phones up and speaks to me and explains what they're going through and um, the forms are filling in is reliably. That's the most important one I can stress to anybody. Because PH, is the way that they judge it, it's black and white. It's, you can do this, you can't do this. Two points, four points, six points. This condition does not live in that black and white world. It's grey, so grey. So some days you can, be do, you can be absolutely fine. Some days you can wake up, make breakfast and not have to worry about it. Other days, don't, don't even talk to me. I'll see you at dinner time. Um, so when you're running through applications explaining that um, what can you do reliably every day and if that is obviously you'll know your conditions better than anybody else um, but so the example I've given myself is I can make my breakfast in the morning but I cannot reliably do it for myself all week so that's one of the criteria that Department of Work and Pensions are looking at is nutrition can you feed yourself essentially so by, with that answer, which I know is from many people who've spoken to me, it's quite a common one, really. Um, or I can make breakfast, but that then tuckers me out, so I can't do dinner, I can't do tea. That I need, I've got somebody there, I've got my partner, I've got a friend who will come and do that for me. Um, that's your answer. And then when they're reviewing that, they can look through it and say, so this person can, yeah, they can do that, but, and then your argument would be, if you ever had to go to appeal, is that, I can make a meal, but I can only make one, or I can only make five per week, or whatever it would be. You know, the argument's there for you, but at least you've started that conversation, and that's the important thing. Um, and I guess with something like this, and again, it's all about offering um, options, really, for you to define and explain what it is that you're going through, is the whole functional class sim. Uh, the whole functional class is a way of describing and defining the symptoms that you're working through. And I'm sure that many clinicians will have mentioned to you, you know, that you sit in two functional class, two, three, four. Um, now, the person that you're applying that, uh, sending off your application to, they probably won't know what the whole functional class is. Um, but you've got it on paper. You wrote down. You wrote down that I, I often sit in... Personally, I feel, and it doesn't have to be on the clinical letters or anything like that, but personally, I feel I sit in who functional class three, which would be something maybe where um, at rest, yep, uh, at rest, all right, but at any exertion, become rapidly breathless. Um, there's your definition. That's not you making that up. It also adds some form of credibility to what it is you're trying to explain to these people, which is it's seen by the World Health Organization as a condition, it has a definition, and here it is. And this is what I feel I suffer from. Uh, sit in. 
But with that in mind, and we get this, I get this a lot when people call up, they're speaking about pH, because with a pH, so it's, that's what they're wanting to talk about, and often it's the main condition that they'll suffer from. But it's not just that, they can suffer from many, it's often a secondary condition, pH. So there are other things, there's rheumatoid arthritis that you may have, but it may just be a partial, something like that. But get it in, talk about it. If you live with it, get it in, put it, put it in, talk about it. Because all that you're trying to do is get more points. And as callous as that sounds, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get that person to tick off another one saying, yep, that's four, that's five, that's six, whatever it would be. And the other thing to think about, and pH isn't just a physical condition, it does affect mentally. So as Janelle said, you know, they often suffer from anxieties attached to breathlessness and just things like that. So the services we provide for that, the Anxiety UK partnerships, things. Mention that. If you, I had somebody phone me up the other day and she could, she walked to work, well, no, she walked from the bus stop to work once. She fainted on the way to work, refuses to do that again because she is so concerned that she is going to pass out again. So even though physically a body allowed her to get onto that bus and get from the bus stop then halfway to work, um, the Department of Work and Pensions, yep, nope, she can walk. Right. Well, she can, but due to anxiety, due to their mental conditions that, you, that they say, that they boast, that they look into, they turned her down. So when we were talking about sort of her appeals process that she was going to go through, Talk about it, put it in, put it that you're suffering from this. And if on the forms there's not a section for it, make one, write it down, put it in the back. If it's on that form, you've done your job and it's in writing and they cannot then dismiss it because you've put it down. Probably should look at the paper. Um, so there's particular things to be wary of and these are people that have, um, again, spoke to me. And this first one, I've put this down because it's, it's quite cheeky. And job seekers allowance. Now with um, personal independent PIM, PIP, they, um, it's a long process, it's arduous. You can be left without money for an extensive period of time and it's so unfair. And what often will happen if you have, do a go to um, job centres or if you do go to citizens advice bureaus or anything like that, if they do offer and they do advise you to go and sign on to job seekers allowance, because that's immediate, they will, they will sign you on immediately no questions asked you're on it but by signing that piece of paper you're saying that you were, you accept that you are fit to work and as you're filling in your PIP application you're saying generally the polar opposite so that then gives then an argument for well you've signed the job seekers agreement so you're saying that you're going to go look for work but you're saying there that you're not so which one is it and we'd much rather you be looking for work than not so just be careful of that one if anybody does. And it's only cropped up a couple of times, but if it's cropped up to a few people, it may be a couple more. Um, again, I've had a phone call in the office last week. Um, there was some um, poor lass that she was getting sort of... Um, somebody had come to her house and they'd done a, uh, an appointment visit. And they were speaking to her about her... Um, What's your best day? But Explain your best day to me. What is it? What is it? The, you know, can you climb the stairs? Like, well... I probably could, but that would be on a day where I'd just be, you know, I'd be all at it and I could do, all oh, right, great stuff. So they wrote that down. But she said, well, what about my bad day? Like, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. Um, she said, well, surely it does, because I live more worse days than good days. I'm like, no, 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 no. So there's a certain point of, if you were to ever go through and, and were ever to have people visit your homes or you were going to go talk to people, having that certain resilience of just saying, no, I will tell you what I want you to know. And what I want you to know is this is what I live with. So I have good days, I have bad days, but generally this is me. Um, and finally, sort of thing to be, keep an eye on, deadlines. Um, there's a reason why on every application, every appeal, every mandatory reconsideration, there's a reason why they all have deadlines. Because the minute that passes, you have to start a new claim. And the moment that happens, they won't backdate your money. So I've had a lady, she was without money for about six months. I don't know how on earth she managed to cope for six months without any money. But what she had done is she'd followed the process word for word, letter for letter, and she'd got her letters in, her appeals in on time, every time. So they backdated all that money, six months worth. And 
whether she paid off the, the loans that she'd had or whatever, I don't know. But if she'd have missed any of that, if at any point she'd have thought, you know what, it's not worth it, I can't do this, she'd have lost that and she'd have had to start all over again. And that's just six months potentially gone. Six months worth of money, six months worth of just gone. Um, so there is a reason why they put them deadlines on. And it's not generally for the benefit of the applicant. So just be careful of that. So, yeah, I guess things to remember sort of as you're going through um, your PIP applications or any application generally, really, is try and use their language as much as po possible because it'll just help. It just makes it easier. That they, They're going through a stack of files that big, so anything that they can just sort of go through, yep, I recognise that, I understand that, tick it off. But, you know, there's certain phrases that it just that you just won't fit in and you just have to explain your condition your best you can. But if you can use their language, throw it in. As they're going through your application, you're starting on zero points. You're starting at the bottom. And it's in a way, and it's wrong, but in a way it's your job to prove that you deserve what it is you're applying for. And that's what that form's for. That's what that, that's what that appeal application's for. That's what that when you have to go and sit in front of a council of three people to explain your case, that's what you're doing. You're, you're explaining why you deserve to have this particular support. Because it's, it's not a handout, it's not something that you just get given. You have to show why you need this support. And that's the other thing. There will be a particular society thing, which they will push on to you, is that, yeah, but couldn't you go to work, though, really? You know, do you really have to take from everybody else? And I know that's happened because people have phoned me up and told me it's been said. Um, and the last thing is persistence. Because, like I say, it's going to be long, it's going to be arduous, it's going to be painful in some ways. And it's pain, isn't it? Um, so don't give up. Keep going. Um, and it will be all worthwhile. Um, but it is just having that sort of, that intestinal fortitude to, do you know what, you're not going to tell me no. I know exactly what I need, I know exactly what I deserve, and I'm going to go and get it. And with that in mind, we have a, uh, a financial impact survey uh, coming up. Um, so sort of off the back of, uh, we did a, an understanding living survey last year, towards the end of last year. Um, and one of the key things that came from it was that the financial impact, not just welfare, you know, there's obviously a, there's a whole host of things that impact financially. Um, but what we're wanting to further understand is what that is. Because uh, it'll help us argue the case on your behalf. It'll help us argue the case in things such as welfare, but obviously then there are other avenues as well we could go down with it. And if you are going through it, if you are going through any particular applications or you do need any help, any support, there's obviously us, um, myself, Helen. Hi, Helen. Hello. Um, but we also have two publications which are available, and there's, uh, we have a partnership with a fellow charitable organisation called Turn To Us, which um, they specialise in um, welfare and grant claims. So they will help, you can input, you, there's in fact there's a calculator on our website, isn't there? Uh, you can put on there the information that you've got, sort of the, the savings you have, the income you've got, everything. It's all confidential, none of it's sent to us, none of it's sent to anybody else, it's just for you. But it will tell you, it will give you a tick list of exactly what you can apply for if you so wish. It's not saying that you're guaranteed to get it, but it's just saying that you can go for this if you want. Um, and they also specialise in particular grant areas as well. So if there's something that you do need, they can help you with that, at least to the best of their ability. Um, and with that, thanks.